All right, so everyone, um, welcome again to everybody. Uh, my name is Carol Bailey White. I'm the president of Duval Audubon Society. Appreciate you all being here for tonight's program, which should be absolutely wonderful. Um, I'll introduce our speaker in just a moment, but just a little bit about our chapter. Uh, we are an all volunteer 501c3 nonprofit that uh, we were founded in 1939. So we have been in, um, I wouldn't say in business, but we've been operating for over 80 years at this point. Uh, we're a chapter of the National Audubon Society and a member of Audubon Florida as well. Um, currently, we have around uh, 1,350 members in Clay Duval and Nassau counties in Northeast Florida. And our mission, our main mission and the main thing that we do is to connect people with nature. So pretty much everything we do uh, has to do with connecting people with nature. Um, all of our activities are welcome. Everyone's welcome to all of our activities. and. Um, Here they are, speaking of activities. Hang on just a second. Let me get my setting properly. Okay. Can everybody hear me all right? Can I get a thumbs up from somebody just to let you know? Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> all right. Our upcoming events uh, next Saturday, uh, or this coming Saturday, February 26th, from 8 a.m. until 12 p.m. We're having our monthly uh, open house event at Crosby Sanctuary in Orange Park. If you haven't ever been there, highly recommend checking it out. It's beautiful this time of year. This is a perfect time of year to go because um, it is cool still, relatively speaking, and it's relatively bug free. Um, it is a swampy sort of property, so that's why we generally don't do anything out there during the summer months, but um, in the springtime, it's just absolutely beautiful and the wildflowers are starting to bloom. So from 8 a.m. until 12 p.m. And you can learn all the uh, information about uh, where that's located if you haven't ever been there, um, just on our website at duvalaudubon.org, uh, or you can go to our meetup site, which is the, the uh, link for that is listed on the bottom of the screen. Did wanna mention that on Thursday, March 3rd, at 5.30 p.m. at the Garden Club, we are hosting, co-hosting, I should say, um, a, a wonderful event featuring uh, Doug Tallamy. It will be a virtual presentation by Doug Tallamy, um, who may be known to many of you uh, as the uh, proponent of the homegrown national park concept, which he will talk about. So he will present virtually. Um, and then after the program, um, He'll have a short question and answer session. Uh, and then there will be um, uh, native plants for sale uh, and lots of brochures and information about native plants. So it should be um, a really good event. Um, so that's gonna be Thursday, March 3rd at 5.30. You do need to register for the event if you plan to attend. You can also um, register just to um, uh, attend virtually, just Doug uh, Tallamy's presentation virtually uh, at that same link. So it's. The link is gardenclubjacks.org slash event slash horticulture dash corner dash grow dash your own your dash own dash park slash. Um, and you can register, like I said, for either to attend in person or just to participate virtually with um, just Doug Tallamy's presentation. Should be good. Our um, next upcoming field trip is going to be Saturday, March 5th at 8 a.m will be at the St. Augustine Road Fish Management Area in Jacksonville. Um, the, the double asterisks means that we do request that you register for any of our field trips on our meetup site, and the link is at the bottom, um, just so that we kind of have an idea of how many people to expect. Uh, the next day, we're having kind of a birding 101 uh, outing at the Castaway Island Preserve uh, from at 8 a.m., and we also ask that you register every every field trip that we have, we do ask that you register in advance. On Saturday, March 12th, we're going to Lake City for a fabulous field trip at Alligator Lake Park, uh, which we haven't been to in quite a while, so that should be good. Um, on Saturday, March 19th, we're having our next nature walk and work day at our Crosby Sanctuary. Uh, and then our next monthly program is actually going to be an in-person program uh, at, um, we're going to be at the Southeast Regional Library, Room B. Um, and it will feature Jack Zebus, who is a local photographer, very, uh, very talented photographer. 
and he's going to be talking about um, bird photography. So that one should be really good. And we do ask that you register for that. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for my slideshow. Let me make sure. Yep. I'm going to stop my share. So now I'm going to uh, introduce our speaker um, and our presentation for this evening, which will be about shorebirds. Uh, uh, Adam Kent has been teaching shorebird identification since the 1990s when he trained naturalist guides in coastal Baja, California. Adam's enthusiasm for the natural world has led to a variety of biological biologist sorry, positions, including assessing sites for the Great Florida Birding Trail, working as Florida's first scrub jay conservation coordinator as a biological consultant, and a natural history tour guide leader, most recently for Eagle Eye Tours. He's also a past president of the Florida Ornithological Society. And um, the program, let me read the program description because I love this program description as well, what we're gonna hear about tonight. Approximately 50 species of shorebirds occur regularly in North America, but only a handful are found in any one place in time. In this presentation, we'll explore differences and similarities among various shorebird groups and discuss shorebird behaviors and identification. If you are a lover of plovers, smitten with sandpipers, or if you sometimes struggle with shorebird identification, this program is for you. Thank you so much for that awesome uh, description, Adam. I just love it. So without further ado, um, this uh, I will hand it over to Adam Kent, um, and you can go ahead and share your screen, and um, here you go. All right. Is that working? Oh, oh, you can see it? All right, thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here or virtually be here uh, at least and talking about one of my favorite groups of birds, which are the shorebirds. And you guys are in such a great location to see lots of different shorebirds. And thank you, Carol, for, for reading that talk description. Also, it's always nice to know what I'm supposed to be talking about there. Uh, so, uh, I, it's this is not going to be a presentation where I just show pictures of 30 or 40 shorebirds and go down a list of field marks because I feel like you can get that kind of stuff in books. But instead, uh, it's called getting to know shorebirds because I'm going to talk about sort of a general shorebird identi identification theory because I think that's the first step to enjoying and appreciating these birds. And they do so many fascinating things. I mean, you could do a whole presentation about shorebird migration. There are a lot of shorebird conservation issues. I know you've got people working up in that area on those issues right now. And uh, so the focus of this will be sort of theory, uh, getting to know shorebirds. And um, we'll look at a bunch of common shorebirds from that area as we do that. And uh, so the first thing it, uh, we'll talk about is shorebird relationships. This isn't, um, you know, like a mating ritual or anything like that. This is how birds are related to each each other. Then shorebird ID clues. There are three basic ID clues for any kind of bird and, and uh, I'll talk about how those relate to shorebirds. And then we'll go into detail on three species of shorebirds in Duval County uh, that we can think of as reference species. And then I'll just mention a few resources at the end. So that'll take, I'll try to keep it to about 45 minutes. Um, so this is from eBird. Uh, you can download the eBird data uh, from the bar charts and into a spreadsheet and play around with it however you want. These are the, out of the 44 species of shorebird that have been reported in Duval County, so out of the approximately 50 in North America, you get a pretty good um, uh, sample there in Duval County. These are the top 10 most frequently reported shorebirds in eBird, uh, which is a great resource that I'll talk a little bit more about later. And they're ranked in order from the most frequently reported down, uh, down the line there. And I put this up there for one to just so you could see the names of the most, uh, we'll, we'll say most frequently, most frequently reported equates fairly well to most common. Um, so you could see the names of those, but also so you can see the scientific names of those. And that's something I'll be talking a lot um, during this presentation is not necessarily the names themselves, but how those scientific names can show you relationships of birds. And if you look at this uh, list, you'll see that of those 10 species, the majority are covered by three genera. And, uh, you know, there's not really a way to get around being too, a little bit technical here at least, um, but uh, 
suffice to say that the genus, the plural is genera, is the first word in the scientific name. So you have the genus and then the species. So for example, for Willet, the genus is Tringa, Semipalmata is the species. And why is this important? Why am I throwing all this, these Latinized words up here on the screen? Because if you see that Willet is a Tringa and you look down the list, if you see another bird that has a genus of Tringa, you know that that bird is going to be closely related to the Willet. In fact, it is very closely related. The greater yellow legs structurally is very, very similar to a Willet size and shape. And um, even some of the, the sounds are a little bit similar. Uh, colors are different, but that colors are one of the most changeable things in birds, as you've probably known if, you, if you've looked at warblers. So we've got two tringas. The genus of the sanderling is Calidris, and if you look down there, there's one more Calidris, which is the Dunlin in the top 10. Ruddy turnstone is the only one in that genus. black white plover, the only pluvialis. But then you get the semi-palmated plover, that's a Caradrius. Kildeer is in the same genus, and then Wilson's plover is also the same genus. So you know those three birds are related. And um, I'm going to be hitting this point a little bit more in this talk than I have in the past, because I think it is very important, and especially for shorebirds, because what you can't tell in shorebirds is, is what is a willet, what is a sanderling. That, those names don't tell you anything about that bird. But the word tringa or the word in willet or calidris and sanderling do tell you a lot about that bird. So even if you don't even have to bother to try to pronounce these words, but when you're looking in your field guide or on eBird or something like that, you look at the scientific name and that'll tell you how that bird is related to other birds. And uh, so the three uh, reference species we'll go into a little bit more detail on tonight are the willet, the sanderling, and the semi-palmated plover. Because these, um, these genera here, Tringa, Calidris, and Caradrius, are not only have multiple representatives in North America, but if you go anywhere in the world, you can find uh, members of these different uh, genera. And knowing th just these three genera will help you a lot when you're birding, not just in North America, but in many other countries. So moving on to the bird ID clues. All bird identification can be broken down into these three general clues, bird's distribution, its behavior, and what it looks like. And we so often focus just on the bird's appearance, but without paying as much as enough attention to those other two clues. And uh, I put them in that way. Uh, distribution really, um, it just helps you narrow down your choices. You can't get a 100% definitive ID hardly ever with distribution for a bird. Um, so I did have that at the end, but it's very important to narrow down your choices. So I put it first. Also, if you had distribution at the end, the acronym would be BAD, and I just thought I didn't want to be teaching people how to be bad birders. So uh, the first clue is distribution, and that means not just distribution in space, like where do they live, but it's also distribution in time. That's why there's that little calendar down there. So we'll go, and, and this clue is split up into three subclues. There's the range, where in the world does it live, the habitat, and that includes microhabitat, and then the seasonality, when, when are the birds in, around. And so you'll notice every good bird book has a range map, and you're probably familiar with these colors. They, they vary. Uh, usually it's some kind of blue for winter, reddish color in the, the summer, and then uh, you know, there's yellow or gray or something in migration. And this map, oh, it kind of makes sense here. Sure, black-bellied plover breed in northernmost North America. They winter on the coasts. And then at this point, you might be thinking, but wait a minute, we see black-bellied plovers on the coast in, in the summer. It doesn't show that. So this is just a very, very rough scale um, distribution map. And that's what all these are. If you imagine trying to show all of North America, in one map. You, you can't get into that kind of detail, really. I mean, they could put Florida in purple because there are black boy plovers year-round there, but, but uh, this is just a broad idea. So, so take these with a grain of salt, and we'll talk a little bit more about distribution in time later. But first, you want to narrow down, does the bird even occur in this area? And then you want to look at the bird's habitat. And um, so the first time I show each different bird species, I'll put its put the names up there. This is a Western and a least sandpiper. You can try to get, I'll give you a little bit of a pause before I put the names up so you can try to guess them yourself, but then I'll, I'll have the names up there because it's a little pet peeve of mine if I can't see the bird's name. But, but I only do that for the first time I show the bird. Um, 
So we've got a western sandpiper and a least sandpiper behind it, and they're in classic shorebird habitat, a little wet mud flat, and this is what you think of when you think of shorebirds. Um, so it's not just any shore, um, but there are different shores, different species are in different types of habitat. So muddy shore is, in general is the best place for shorebirds. Uh, you do find shorebirds in grassy areas. The killdeer is by far the most common shorebird inland, uh, but if you're looking for some of the rarer migrants, you want to go inland to grassy areas to find something like this. Do you recognize that one? It's the only member of their, the genus Bartramia. That's the upland sandpiper, and they like really big grassy areas. So not just grassy areas, but very large grassy areas with very short grass. So you're getting into habitat, and then you're kind of even thinking about microhabitat a little bit. If the grass in there were too much longer, they, they wouldn't be there. They, they like to be able to see. And this is one of one of a few species of shorebirds during migration. If you go to sod fields where you can sometimes find them, especially if they've got little damp places or just very large sod fields where these birds um, will stop during migration. And, um, oh, let's see, I'm gonna put the name of this one here. That's Homo sapiens. Uh, rack is another important part of, of habitat. Uh, and you'll often find birds up in rack, whether they're in the rack down by the water, in the rack way up in the beach, um, how they are using the rack, that's all a good clue to the bird's behavior. And um, then getting into micro uh, habitat a little bit more, there is the swash zone. And if you guys are all tuning in from Duval County, you may know that that's the area where the waves are lapping up on the beach, that kind of wet area where these birds in the foreground are foraging. And, and then a little bit uh, where the taller birds in the back are foraging. And so this microhabitat is, is, is a good clue for shorebirds and, and any birds. There's not, you know, microhabitat of say warblers, it could be in the, in the woods, that would be the habitat, but what about if the warbler is foraging in dead leaves or in vines or closer to the ground or in the canopy? All those are kind of microhabitat clues. And in this case for shorebirds, we've got these bigger birds in the back that are foraging in the deeper water and that's a clue that birds in the foreground are sanderlings and then the background it's uh they're willets and sanderlings don't like to go in that deep water you rarely see them in there they just like to get their feet damp uh, whereas willets don't mind wading around in that deeper water so you'll it's not so unusual in fact it's pretty common if you're down at the beach right now or just about any time to see uh, these birds, uh, these are two of the most common birds in the swash zone, and they'll divide the zone like this. The sanderlings right at the, the tip of the waves and the willets down a little bit lower in the deeper water. And then uh, here is, uh, you guys are probably familiar with this one, but you may not have ever seen it walking in the grass like this. Birds can fly, of course, and they don't always read the rule books, and they do show up in weird places sometimes. And so you might find a sanderling walking around in the grass. It's definitely not the first place you'd look for sanderlings, but but they, sorry, ruddy turnstone, I'm talking about ruddy turnstone, you, you could find a sanderling in the grass too. Um, but uh, so you can expect the unexpected, but be prepared for for understanding these, um, these microhabitats. Finally, in distribution, seasonality, and this is a very important clue that often gets overlooked. And the best way to find that out these days is eBird bar charts. And I kind of, clipped and pasted and manipulated this so you could read it better um, and just put the four letter codes for these three species sanderling dunlin and purple sandpiper in there <laughs> but uh if you have not done this yet i highly recommend getting into ebird uh you should know about that resource hopefully and go to the explore tab go to bar charts you can look at them for a statewide, you can look at it countywide, which is very useful, but you can even look at it at a site, at, uh, an eBird bar chart for a site, say Huguenot Park or something. And so what are you getting out of this? So what you can see is sanderlings, if, if you can't read the top because it's kind of pale, it starts at January and ends at December. It's just going across the months of the year on that uh, top there. So sanderlings are in, this is for Duval County. Uh, Sanderlings are there year round. They're less common in June and July, but they still are around. So you could see a sanderling on the beach any time of year. Dunlin, on the other hand, when you have just these little dots, those are isolated records. That means the bird is pretty rare at that time. So from June through, you know, 
mid-September, dunlin are really not very common in the county. Uh, that's just something to keep in mind if you see something in its August and you think it's a Dunlin, well, you better be careful and, and make extra care that it's not something else because Dunlin shouldn't be there then. And then the purple sandpiper is even more dramatic. Uh, they don't show up until November. So there, there may be some records that are not put in eBird, but I know uh, Kevin Daly and some other people are pretty good at putting old records in. So you probably, if, if you think you're going to see a purple sandpiper in October, you probably are wrong. It'll if you want to find them, start going out maybe second week in November to, to look for purple sandpiper in rocky areas. So these, these bar ch charts are super useful uh, if you're planning a trip, going anywhere, or just trying to get to know your local bird better. I highly recommend these bar charts. You can, you can when you go to that Explore tab, you can click on some symbols by the bar charts for more information, like exactly where the birds were seen or some different types of graphs based on high counts and things like that, but I'm, I'm not going to get into all, to all that stuff now. You guys, if you haven't already, you might be having somebody do a talk on how to do eBird, I guess. So the next clue is behavior. In this, a lot of birds can be identified just by their behavior. Like I said, you can't necessarily identify a bird just by its distribution, even um, you know if you're going down to microhabitat in time of year. But behavior, uh, you can identify birds just based on their behavior. Um, this is a ruddy turnstone here, and if you have spent any time on beaches in Florida, you know we don't really have stones. So these, this guy's turning over a seed, they turn over sand, shells, they plow through uh, uh, seaweed. They, in Florida, we could just call them the ruddy turn anything. Um, and they're very opportunistic foragers also. They not only go around flipping over uh, bits of detritus on, on the beach, but they'll, they're cheeky and it, I, yeah, I've had one run up to me and try to steal the uh, meat out of my sandwich once. I was sitting on the um, Castillo de San Marco in, in, in San Augustine and in, I haven't seen this yet in the States, but in other countries in the Caribbean, I have seen ready turnstones walking around in restaurants like house sparrows or something. They'll come land on your table where you're sitting at the table and try to grab food off your plate. Um, so that they're they're very opportunistic birds, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about them in just a little bit. Okay, but the first behavior is sound, and you might be thinking, well, shorebird sound. I mean, they're out there on the beach; you can see them all. Sound actually is really good, and I forgot to mention when we started. One of my favorite things about shorebirds is you can see them. They're actually out in the open usually. I know every once in a while they are uh, a mile away on the farthest sandbar. But for the most part, if you want to, any day you can go out and get good looks at some shorebirds and, and study them really closely. Uh, but sound, you might be thinking then, well, how does that relate? Is, is that even useful? A lot of times, um, some the first time I, I find a black belly plover, they'll just come flying in and you hear that distinctive, I can't imitate it that well, and I'm not set up to do sounds here, but it's a teary sound that carries very far and um, if they're flying by, that, that's key. And this is especially useful if you're inland and you're um, having shorebirds fly by. Um, sound, in fact, is the best way to identify, and uh, then I'll talk about other behaviors after I talk about sound a little more. The sound is the best way to identify a few species of shorebirds that are very similar. Here we have a couple of yellow legs. I've manipulated the size a little bit so they're about the same size. I might have to make that left image slightly bigger so it's exactly the same size. Um, but that is a lesser on the left and the greater on the right. And um, the lesser yellow legs and greater yellow legs have different calls. The, the greater is very emphatic, does it three or four times. Lesser is a much quieter, softer call. It doesn't call as much. Um, luckily, greater is especially call a lot. Um, and they can be tricky to identify. We'll talk a little bit more about how you identify them by their appearance, but the sound is a great clue. And greater yellow legs, just like black bellied plover, a bird that you, uh, especially since they're inland, you'll often, you're maybe by a, a pond or something like that, you'll hear the sound of a greater yellow legs uh, long before you see it. Here is another bird, uh, um, when it's in any other plumage, well, when it's in the winter plumage, uh, that is best identified by sound. This is a juvenile. Um, anybody know what this one is? That is a short-billed dowager. And uh, because you can't hear it now, you can tell it's short-billed dowager because of the pattern 
in these feathers here, the tertials and the greater coverts. It's got these orange markings. Um, but in the winter plumage, they don't have those markings. Um, and uh, long-billed dowitchers are have those feathers are are kind of plain gray. Um, there's overlap in the bill size, so that's not 100% of the time um, distinctive. But the call, if you hear them, especially in the winter when they're kind of taking off or or foraging, it might be a two 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 for the uh, short-billed dowitcher, just a, a sort of quiet, soft, um, a little bit like the lesser yellow legs actually. Um, and the uh, long-billed dowager is a single keek, uh, a different, a very different sounding note. So, so uh, there's all these different ways you can kind of guess what you might be looking at based on the, the structure and long-billed dowager is looking more like they swallowed a grapefruit and um, things like that. And the, and the longest beak of a long-billed dowager is longer than an average short-billed dowager, but uh, there is a lot of overlap in these. So, so sound is a really good clue. If you're watching dowagers, try to See if you can hear them. And then other behaviors are useful. And this is, this is where I think it gets fun because you get those shorebirds that are a mile away, literally, or a few hundred yards, yards away, maybe too far to see any details, but you can still pick out what they are and guess what they are. Sometimes you can even get the species just based on their behaviors, even when you can't see any, any um, plumage details. So let's start with our familiar sanderling here. So they, these are the guys that are running back and forth in front of the wave. They're around all year round, but not as many in the summer. Their behavior is running really quickly in front of the waves and then they're probing, like uh, sandpipers in general have probing beaks. So they probe into the sand, they move so quickly, it looks like they're not even stopping to eat anything. They're actually slurping up really small crustaceans or other even biofilm or, or other small invertebrates that, that are uh, buried in the sand or at, at the top of the sand. And they're, they're moving very, very quickly running around. They look like they're always running. Okay, this is another sandpiper. And I'll talk about the differences between sandpipers and plovers in a little bit. This is a short-billed dowager again. You can tell because of these, um, the markings in the tertials and greater coverts. Um, and dowagers are sandpipers and they're probing. But instead of running around like crazy, like a sanderling, they're probing methodically. They're, they'll be walking. Sometimes they may be a little bit frantic, but they're, they're probing in more of a sewing machine motion. They're not running like crazy all over the place like a, like a sanderling. Uh, and then, oh, a couple more sandpipers first. Um, this is a spotted sand, sandpiper. Okay, I hadn't showed that one before, so it's, you get his name there. Uh, you'll, you'll see that genus Actetes. It's the only one of that genus in the New World, but if you're in Eurasia, uh, there is a, a sandpiper called the common sandpiper, which is in the same genus and very closely related. So these little red lines here behind the bird's tail are indicating that it moves that part of its body up and down. It bobs its tail up and down, and it, they usually do that pretty consistently when they're foraging and walking around in the mud. So that can be a good clue for spotted sandpipers. And their, their habitat also, they're often more inland than you'd see some of the uh, coastal shorebirds and little muddy ponds and things like that. Um, so they're bobbing their tail, whereas this one, you know what that is? That's a tringa, it's a solitary sandpiper. They're bobbing their head or their chest up and down. It's a different kind of bobbing. And that's not to say that, that they cannot bob their tails or spotted sandpipers cannot bob their heads but if you watch it for a while you'll 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 see this pattern and and so something if you just key into the the fact that spotted bobs their tail solitary bobs their head and you only look at the bird for two seconds and you see it just do one bob that's not a it's not distinctive because you, you need to watch it for a while but if you watch the bird for five minutes and it's bobbing its tail the whole time or it doesn't bob its tail rarely bobbed its tail and then it bobbed its head up and down that that's kind of what you need when you're when you're assessing behaviors it's, it takes a little bit longer to um judge sometimes these behaviors than, than um you know they're, they're not uh completely set in stone but uh the, the bobbing of the head is in in four parts are are distinctive of that genus genus tringa and so while while you might find a solitary sandpiper in a similar habitat as a, um, a spotted sandpiper, maybe even a little bit more vegetation around it or more trees around it, um, but these inland muddy vegetated areas. Um, if you think, and, and, and so people will confuse these two, but if you think 
solitary sandpiper is a tringa. It's more closely related to yellow legs and a willet than it is to a spotted sandpiper. That can kind of put you in a different mindset for trying to identify it. You know, what is, oh, bright yellow legs. Maybe the legs are a little bit taller. Maybe the body is a little bit longer. And then they do this um, tringa behavior that the yellow legs especially do, not as much the willet, that, the head pump. Now we're into the plovers or plovers. However you want to say it is fine. This one is the one uh, from your introductory slide, the semi-palmated plover. And I'm just noticing those semi-palmated means they've got a little bit of webbing between their toes, but it's really hard to see. You can't even tell in this one. You can barely see right there. Semi-palmated plover. There you go. That proves it. It's a caradrius. These are the um, the ringed plovers uh, or the smaller plovers. They all have some semblance of a ring around their neck. And plovers feed very differently than sandpipers. They do a run-stop, run-stop behavior. Um, they'll run really fast, and, and they've got big eyes. They're visual foragers. They'll run quickly. They'll stop. They'll grab something. They'll eat it or they'll stop and look around and then they'll run somewhere else. And, and sandpipers don't forage like that. And um, so that's uh, a, a semi-palmated plover, which is the most common one uh, around there. We'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. And uh, how about this one? Look at that beak, a little bit, a lot bigger beak, fortunately. That's a Wilson's plover. Um, and, and, and I just said a lot bigger beak proportionately. That's because it's not really that long a beak, but for a plover beak, it's long. And I'm gonna talk more about that in, in a little bit too, um, about judging bill size. So, uh, but within behavior, just like we are talking about within habitats, you have micro habitats. Within behaviors, you kind of have micro, ha micro behavior. So um, the plovers in general run, stop, run, stop. Wilson's plover runs a little farther, a little faster, and they'll often hunch all the way down so their back there is sort of horizontal with their head. Whereas in the previous picture, you can see semi palmated plovers don't really do that. They keep their head up. Wilson's plovers can have, run with their head up, but they like to run down there. It just makes them feel like they're going faster. It makes them more streamlined or something. Snowy plovers will do that also, um, but you don't have those there so much. Um, and then the last clue is appearance and that is what most people clue in on but as we've already seen you can tell a lot of birds um, by these other clues and, and before I, I, I um, get into appearance I was going to mention for behavior so say that those shorebirds are actually are a mile away and they're on a mud flat and you're looking at them thinking oh this is painful or useless I'm not going to get anything out of this it's just a bunch of little specks well instead of just you know giving up or, or something like that watch them for a while and you'll notice these behaviors it's actually really fun instead of focusing on on the plumage details see what behaviors you'll see and you'll pretty soon be able to pick out the little ones that are scurrying around really fast and not stopping that much and those are the sandpipers they're probably running around if they're running right in the swash zone good chance they're sanderlings um, and then you'll see the ones that run and stop and run and stop and even at a pretty good distance uh, wilson's plover that's a little bit bigger than than a um, semi-palmated plover but a black-bellied plover is much bigger and so if you see its a body size is about the size of a willet so if you see a bigger bird doing that run stop run stop then um, you can be pretty sure in Florida that's going to be a, a black-bellied plover all right so on to appearance here um, and this is what we key in on but it also uh, can be very tricky, so I leave this one for last. You should have the, some idea of what you're looking at based on those behaviors before you're, you know, maybe subconsciously before you're thinking about the appearance. And this is a piping plover. Um, what, we'll, what we'll talk about then, appearance, I'd like to break it into three things. The bird structure, this is the most important thing. Relative size and the shapes of the bird. And then it beaks, the bill, same thing, um, use either word. Um, that's so important that I normally, that's considered part of structure. It is part of the bird structure, but it's so important. It just, I like to break that out into to a different clue. And then patterns and lastly, colors, uh, because those are the easiest things to misinterpret, even though they can be very useful, the, the colors. So this is a black-bellied plover, uh, pluvialis, well, pluvialis. That is, the, it's the only one that you regularly see, but the, the American golden plover is in that same genus. And, um, it's 
about the same weight, even slightly heavier than the sandwich turns in the background, but it's also shorter because it doesn't have a long beak, doesn't have a long tail. So when you're looking at bird measurements, if you're trying to study up on bird identification or you're going somewhere new where you don't know the birds or even trying to get to know your local bird better, uh, a lot of books will have the, the mass or the weight of the birds. And it's useful to look at that and say, okay, what's the mass of a black-bellied plover compared to a Wilson's plover compared to a, um, uh, a semi-palmated plover? Because it gives you a, a, a good idea of relative size. It's a little bit better, I think, in a lot of cases than length. All right, so you've got how many different kinds of birds here? Let's see here. We've seen all of these before, so I didn't put their name up. Um, there's one in the back right that definitely looks different. Um, and then you've got all these other ones um, that are kind of similar shape. You can see, for example, these two. Well, these are similar shape and similar color, but all the shorebirds, by the time they're flying around and migrated to Florida, they're all the same size, whether or not they're young ones or old ones. Now, if you're if you're on a beach like Jacksonville Beach somewhere where, where you have uh, little chicks that can't fly yet, you can get very cute, tiny little cotton balls with legs. And, and But by the time they're flying, especially by the time they're, they're flying well, they're the same size and shape as an adult, basically the same shape. So so these cannot be the same species. And a lot of times someone goes might think if you're a beginner, well, that's a baby of this one, but it's way too much smaller. There's no way. And there is individual variation in lots of birds but but not as much in shorebirds as something like gulls there's a lot of variation in gulls so so you got to think well these are probably all the same and they are and so remember this pattern from the dowichers and this is a juvenile you've got a juvenile short-billed dowicher this is just a one that's uh back up not in that uh in that plumage it's an adult and then these ones are a lot, lot bigger. You can see how long the beak is. The only thing that fits that bill is the willet. And then this one with the shorter beak, which for some reason I can't see because I got some stuff on my screen here. Um, that is the black belly plover. The beak is so much shorter in that top right one than it is on the other ones. Um, hopefully that won't be a problem. Okay, so another thing is uh, structurally, all right, this is a different word. This is a uncommon to rare it probably overlooked migrant and it's only there in migration it's not there in the summer at all and they don't stick around the winter either this is a kind of tricky one one of the identification features is these long wings that stick out behind the tertials we're talking about appearance here so the attenuation of the body uh, with when you have longer wings the whole body often will look longer and then these the black part right at the back side are the tips of the primaries tips of the wings and then these other feathers are the tertials. So those primary tips stick out a ways behind the tertials and the tip of the tail. Um, it's not a ton, and it's subtle, it takes some getting used to, but that those do stick out more than other uh, birds in the same genus, other little peeps. And you've got some pretty distinct fine streaking here. You can almost see a little bit of color in the lower mandible. You might've guessed it by now. That's the white rump sandpiper. So that's one that um, comes through and especially in the fall, but um, I, I do think these get overlooked. Um, and uh, let's see, moving on to beaks. All right, here is a yellow leg. It's got bright yellow legs, and Bill looks pretty small. We know there are two species of yellow legs, and so how do we di distinguish them? This is a lesser yellow legs. So the what you can do, you can either think about taking the front of the bill and just pushing it backwards through the bird's head, which is pretty mean. It's just equally as mean as taking the bill and snapping it off at the base and flipping it around backwards. So instead of doing either of those, we're just gonna put a little graphic up in the screen here with that, that measures the tip of the bill, the back of the head, and then where the bill meets the head. And you can see this whole thing about pushing it back into the head. The bill is about the same length of the head. And that's that's good key for lesser yellow legs. Maybe if, if it, if it's a little bit long, then it might stick out a little bit in the back if you pushed it backwards into the head. But greater yellow legs bills always stick out a lot more. Um, they're, they're a good bit heavier. They're, they're also heavier. They're longer and heavier. And um, 
another thing about shorebird bills, the females have longer bills. And then there is a good bit of individual variation. So a long-billed female, greater yellow legs, is very obviously very long-billed. But a short-billed male greater yellow legs, um, proportionate for its size, because greater yellow legs are a lot bigger than lesser yellow legs, proportionate for its size, its bill will look about the same length as a long-billed female lesser yellow legs. Just to put that another way, the, the, the smallest birds with the longest bill will proportionally look about the same size bill as the larger birds with the smallest bill. So um, they can be tricky sometimes. They can be completely obvious, but they can also be pretty tricky. It's, it's not a, a super easy identification all the time. But if you think about how far that bill would stick back through the back of the head, watch them forage for a while, see if you can hear them call, see if there are any other birds nearby that you can use as a point of reference for size, um, and then just watch them and get used to how they look. There are other subtle things about their shapes that I'm not going to go into here because it, it, it's pretty subtle, but they're, um, you'll get familiar with these birds. Um, so instead of thinking, all right, it, it, say it's a, it's a short build, lesser yellow legs, you know what it is because it's next to a greater yellow leg. Instead of going, okay, two species of yellow legs, got that, let's go look at something else, especially with yellow legs, take a while watch the birds, watch their behaviors. Uh, greater yellow legs run around more, they'll catch little fish. You don't see lesser yellow legs do that. Think about how their shape changes as they move. Just watch them. They can be fairly common in, in little um, muddy areas. You can get decently close. We've got some retention ponds down in Gainesville where you can just pull right up there by parking lots and you can watch the yellow legs foraging and they don't uh, seem to mind as long as you don't get too close. They, they can be a little bit down, you know, don't want to scare them away, but they can be fairly tame. All right, so that even works with smaller species here. These are two shorebirds in the group of shorebirds that are often referred to as peeps, just because they're the smallest shorebirds. And we, which one of these has a longer beak at first, before you even try to guess what they are? Does one of them have a longer beak than the other? Yes, definitely it's the one on the left. So if you know that Western and semi-palmated sandpipers look very similar, but Westerns average longer build, then you can make a pretty good guess on these. Um, there's a couple other things I'm, I'm, I'll mention in, in, a, in a bit, but um, you can do the same thing with these beaks as we did with the yellow legs. The, the uh, Western sandpiper on the left, that beak is definitely longer than the head, whereas the uh, semi-palmated sandp uh, semi sandpiper on the right, the beak is definitely shorter. This is another one like the yellow legs where there's a little bit of overlap. So sometimes they can be tricky, but often the nice thing is often there'll be a group of them and on average they're, they're distinctly longer. So um, within a group, you may see a couple birds that are sort of tweeners and then you kind of got to get a feel for some other things. But uh, um, in general, you can, if you watch them for a while, you see a few of them, you'll, you'll get a good feel for these bill lengths. All right, I did some little weird thing here just to get the colors out of the way and so you could focus just on shapes. All the birds on the left are plovers and all the birds on right are sandpipers and not just sandpipers, but they're sandpipers in the genus Calidris, the little um, peep type sandpipers. And when you look at the beaks, you can see for a, for a plover, the top one is a piping plover, uh, that it's pretty short. The beak, if you turn that around, it barely reached to the eye. Whereas the, the middle one is a Wilson's and the bottom one is a black bellied plover. If you flip those bills around, they go a little bit past the eye, but they're not as long as the head. They're still definitely shorter than the head. They're also kind of thick. They've got a little point and they're Some of them, especially the top two, are a little bit bulbous near the tip. Um, then if you look on the right, the top two, it's the uh, semi-palmated sandpiper on the top and the western sandpiper at the bottom. Definitely longer beak on that western sandpiper. Um, slight curve down on, on those beaks also. And then the bottom one is a sanderling, similar shape to somewhere between a, a semi-palmated and western sandpiper there. It's slight downward curve. And it matches their foraging style. They, these guys on the right, the sandpipers are probing into the substrate. The guys on the left are plovers, they're running and just grabbing something off the surface mostly. And here they are um, without their um, fancy black and white 
coloration that I did in the previous slide. Another thing that you can kind of see in this slide, the semi-palmated sandpiper usually shows a little bit of a capped look. So the crown, this area right here, has these dark streaks in it, and the, the nape is a little paler, and that you don't see that on Western sandpipers. So take some, it's very subtle, it takes some experience, takes some getting used to, but that is another identification feature for um, semi-palmated versus Western sandpiper. Uh, then finally, patterns and colors. Uh, this one, it just blows my mind how well these things blend in with the background. I mean, I, I took this picture and just by chance, I was looking at that thinking, it seems like if I didn't know any better, I'd say someone went in Photoshop and tried to blend the crown and the back in with the background. That's just, that's just how well these things blend in with their background. And it, and it makes sense then that this is a, uh, a piping plover. It makes sense that these are often found in the drier sand that are, that's paler colored. Um, and in fact, the piping plovers that are that breed on the Great Lakes that are much more rare than the Northeast coastal breeding piping plovers, those have a little bit slightly darker backs and the substrate that they're on is a little bit more muddy, it's a little bit darker. Um, so, so this, they're pale, in this picture that you can see the back is very pale, but it also depends on the light. That last picture, you can tell uh, the, the one in the bottom right, the shadow is below the bird, so the sunlight is pretty direct. This, this one in the top left is also a piping plover, but the sun is, is very low. It gets, it's nice for photography, but it, these birds are exactly the same color. You would be, you know, if someone asked you to describe those colors, you'd say, oh, real pale gray and that's brown. But they're the same color. It's just the lighting, same species. Legs look brighter. These legs on the guy in the bottom right are in the shade, and it looks more brown. The tail, the back parts, anything in the shadow looks dark. Um, so it's something to keep in mind when you're looking at colors. And then we're gonna talk about plumages. So this is a sanderling again. This is the plumage you see them in mostly. It's an adult and uh, easy way to think of this plumage is a non-breeding plumage. It's sometimes called the basic plumage, the uh, winter plumage, the boring plumage. No, no one says that. Um, but this is the, the pale gray back in that black shoulder pretty distinctive this is what we see them looking like for most of the year Sanderling. then in breeding plumage which we only see for a short time uh late in april may uh they'll get this really pretty color this blends into the tundra really well imagine those bright white birds nesting on the tundra that would be that stand out but these guys uh are, are camouflaged um just we don't see them that much if we do see them in the summer they're usually gonna look like the, the winter plumage birds and it'll be a young bird that just didn't molt into, uh, didn't attain uh, the, the breeding plumage when it molted. They just molted into something that looked like a winter plumage. Then you've got transitional plumage. This is a guy in August 3rd. So that's fall, an adult that's done breeding and it's losing that um, camouflage with the tundra color and it's turning whitish. But you'll see it, the birds don't lose all their feathers immediately at once it takes a few weeks to a few months and so it um uh, you'll see these kind of mottled colored birds and then last but not least is the juvenile or juvenile plumage and uh, these are, are i think they're the prettiest plumages uh, for one the feathers all grow in at the same time they go from their little downy fluff ball um the, the cotton ball and toothpicks look to getting their adult feathers and all those adult feathers grow in at the same time. So they're even, they're nice kind of a yeah, even, even pattern. And then they also often have more distinct patterns than the adults. So the, this, you know, the juvenile sanderling here has these really distinct black centers. And they only hold this for a few months. So by midwinter, definitely by now, you will not be seeing any birds in a plumage that looks like this. All right, let's see how well we do with these plumages. How about number three, which one is that? Okay, well, just let you, we can't, it's not really very interactive here. I'll um, just take a minute, see if you can identify each of these three plumages, and then we'll, we'll check and see on the next slide. I think you got them all. Ooh, here's a hint, I left out transitional. All right, so there's the um, juvenile, 
the breeding, also called the alternate plumage, uh, and then the non-breeding plumage, which is also referred to as a basic plumage. All right, same thing goes with black-bellied plovers. Um, so pretty, look at that. Right? No. Um, so it, you can see why in the rest of the world outside the Americas, they're called the gray plover because they look gray for most of the year. Um, but we call them the black belly plover because in breeding plumage, they've got black on their belly. And this was taken, I, I didn't put the date in here, I think it was April. They will get even more black below than that. And uh, so going out and looking at shorebirds, you gotta make an effort to go out and check them out in May when they're getting all these cool breeding colors. Um, but the, the, the structure does not change. You don't get any, the beak, the legs, the wing shape, that doesn't change at all on any of our North American birds with uh, shorebirds with the season. Um, here is a black-bellied plover in an interesting plumage. It looks like it has a little V on its neck or something like that. So if you weren't thinking about structure and behavior and you were just kind of keyed in on on plumages, you'd think, well, what the heck is this bird? I saw a bird running on the beach and it had a V on its neck. You might think, someone, you're explaining that to someone, they think a meadowlark, was it yellow below? What, what bird has a V on the neck? That, that V is really sort of incon inconsequential as far as the identification of that bird. It, it's, it's growing it in, but um, you gotta understand that it's the, the structure that's important and then, and then the behavior of the running and stopping. Uh, these are longer leg than the other plovers, but you can see that distinct plover bill. They've got that big head that protrudes a lot. This shape is identifiable at a very long distance. And when you couple it with the behavior, these guys, um, and, and, and the fact that they're around uh, year, year round, they don't, uh, there are always a few birds hanging out on the beaches, even in the summer. They're great birds to study. When they fly, they've got these black uh, underwing, um, sort of the armpits is what they're called, the axillaries, uh, underwing coverts right by the body. And those can, if, if you practice looking at them, you can, you can kind of get a good feeling for um, what they look like, but um, they can also be hard to see if you're, um, especially at a distance and the bird's flying, depending on the angle that they're flying. Um, and then they also have a white lump. And so here's a bad picture at a distance. Here you can see on three of these, birds, you can see the black underwing, you can see the, the white on the rump of this other one here, and then this one is a turnstone with these uh, dark and light, dark and light colors. And uh, one other little uh, feature here that you might not uh, hear about in a field guide is the um, lesser underwing covers. These are long-billed dowitchers. We talked about listen, identifying dowitchers by their call, but if you can get a photograph of them, uh, this area right here, the front of the under part of the wing where it meets the body is paler in long-billed dowitchers. This can be very hard to see in flight with naked eyes, but um, if you get a photograph, that is distinctive. And usually it, it'll, it'll come out. Uh, Short-billed dowitchers have markings there, so it doesn't look quite as pale. So also think about the um, lighting as we talked about again with the, the, um, the piping plovers. These are all least sandpipers, even though a few of them look darker and they turn they turn direction and they look really dark, but um, that's just the, the trick of the light and kind of reflecting off the water and backlit. Um, so you do have to think about how the light is affecting the bird's coloration. All right, so, oops, this should say three, not four, reference shorebirds. Uh, the willet, this is one we've talked about. I just want to mention this again, because if you know these three species well, um, as I mentioned, you've got the, the genus down that, um, That'll lead you in the right direction in narrowing down your choices. So you've got a long beak, long legs. Well, it's got more kind of grayish or greenish or sometimes even almost bluish legs, but they're never uh, yellow like a yellow legs. And the summer there, um, this, we have two probably at some point will be split into species of willets that are in Florida, the Western willets that breed in the Great Plains and are here in the winter. And some of them are here in the summer also, the ones that don't migrate, that aren't breeding, some few young ones hang around. And then um, that's what this is here with the long beak. And then we have the Eastern willets, which are shorter legged, shorter, stubbier beaked, Eastern and then a little heavier mark below. And Eastern willets will perch up often, and, and oh, before I get into the behavior, starting with the first clue of, of distribution, 
Um, their eastern willets are only here in the spring and summer, a little bit fall, but then they're down in the Caribbean in the winter. Um, and they're in salt marshes and the, they can be on the coast, especially in migration, but they're also mostly in salt marshes. They're breeding up in salt marshes. And they, in talking about behavior, they perch up on top of things like posts or telephone poles. And I have never seen a Western willet perch on top of something like that. I'm not saying they can't, but if you see a willet perched on top of a post, it's probably an Eastern willet. All right, willets and black-bellied plovers weigh about the same on average, but look how much longer the beak is there. That's, that really stands out on, on the willet on the left. And there's the black boyed plover on the right. And then when they, when they fly, you've got that, uh, the black and white pattern, the wing, which is distinctive. And that you could probably tell that at about a mile away with, with binoculars, um, that distinctive black and white wing pattern. And we mentioned the foraging already um, in the deeper water than, than the sanderling. So that's another thing just to keep, keep in your mind there. And next one, next reference bird is the sanderling. It's a calidris like these other peeps, pale backed. Uh, they are the birds. Uh, so they are foraging in the swash zone there in groups, big groups. You wouldn't see a big group of, of turnstones or something like that. It'd be very unlikely to see a group of turnstones foraging like that. Um, these guys look even paler because they're in very direct light. They've got these fun aggressive displays where um, every once in a while one will pick a stretch of beach that it really likes and it'll chase other birds away and make a little growling noise. Um, and then, so even though their backs are really light, same thing as the, the, the least sandpipers, if you get um, bad light, they're gonna look really dark. So it's just something to keep in mind. And here, here is one. Um, so if you've got the same lighting on a few birds, then that's the best way to judge the differences. So this sanderling is, uh, is compared with a couple of turnstones there. You can see the big white stripe in the wing too. And uh, finally, we've got three species of birds here. Uh, the sanderlings are the ones on the right. The one on the far right is in breeding plumage and the other two are not. And then to the left of them, that bird's a little smaller, a little shorter beak. That's a semi-palmated sandpiper. And then farther to the left, it's kind of hard to tell if it's smaller or just down the hill a little bit. It is slightly smaller and you can just barely see it's got yellow legs, but it definitely has more brownish wash across the chest. This is one of the smallest sandpipers in the world, the least sandpiper. So it's great when you've got other sandpipers mixed in. If you've got the, once you know sanderlings really well, you won't be confused by that one in breeding plumage because you'll know it. So it's the same structure and size, everything as the as the ones that, that I'm used to seeing all winter long. And then you can use those as reference points for identifying your um, least or your semi-palmated or Western sandpipers. Um, semi-palmated plover is the last reference uh, species. Uh, just thinking to watch these guys they are common on the beach. Uh, they've got that plover behavior. Uh, some of them might be around all year round. Um, you can see their plumage change a little bit. You can compare them with a piping plover. Um, think about how the coloration of, uh, of the semi-palmated plover changes with the lighting. If a bird's facing into the light as opposed to away, away from the light, if the light is intense or not so intense. And um, look at the differences in, in, in the behavior and how they hunch down when they run and things like that. And then um, the, the two that you will see that look pretty similar uh, color wise, but are structurally different are the, uh, oops, are the uh, Wilson's plover on the left and the semi-palmated plover on the right. And even though it's only a difference of a few millimeters, the, the bill just looks huge on that Wilson's plover and it looks very tiny on the semi-palmated plover. Another thing that is different on the Wilson plover is the legs. Their, their legs are a little bit longer. You can see the distance between the knee, which is actually the ankle, and then the body. Um, and they're a little heavier than, than the um, semi-palmier plover. And then the head sticks out a little bit more. Um, little subtle differences like that. So, um, you know, the more you spend, more time you spend watching um, one of these things, the more of these little details you start to pick up. And it's just the thing that I love about watching shorebirds is you can just sit there and watch them for a long time. And they're, they're fun to watch. They're active. They've got personalities or chase each other around. And um, so 
there's a couple of good resources. The, the, my favorite resource for shorebirds of North America is this book, which is The Shorebird Guide by Michael O'Brien, Richard Crossley, and Kevin Carlson. And whereas a lot of the shorebird guides just have a whole bunch of shorebirds and text with them, like um, almost like a, in a field guide, this one has quiz photos, which I think are a really good idea. It's got silhouettes. It's got a lot of good natural history information. So if you're going to just get one shorebird re re resource, I would get this, the shorebird guide. Uh, and then I had to throw in this book because I love it, not just because I think this guy has the best birder name of anyone in the world, Fancy Peacock, but because um, even though it's old world waders, um, that's the same as waders means shorebirds in the old world, and it's really, it's Southern African, uh, you'll see, uh, you can get this book um, as a digital, um, a digital copy, it's maybe 15 or $17 or something like that. Um, so you can look at it on your laptop, uh, on PDF or your phone or whatever. Um, and there's all kinds of really fun information in here. Beautiful illustrations, eggs, shorebird migration, shorebird eyes, shorebird feet, uh, all kinds of neat things in there. And if you're going birding in, in Africa or anywhere in the old world, this is, this is a great resource. Um, so just as I'm winding up here a little bit about shorebird conservation, there are some shorebirds that are uh, declining in, or endangered. This is a red knot. They, their populations have declined a lot. A lot of them you'll see are, um, are banded. If you see uh, a banded bird, you can go online, Google report banded bird, and you'll figure out how to um, get the information to, from where to send the, the bands. So that's something good you can do because trying to uh, Shorebird biologists are trying to figure out where these birds go, what habitats they use, um, how long they live, things like that. Um, if you want to get more involved with shorebirds, I highly recommend the Florida Shorebird Alliance. This is a kind of a, a joint project between um, Audubon, FWC, Florida the Fish and Wildlife Commission, and then the Fish and Wildlife Service. And there you can be a shorebird monitor, you can be a beach monitor, protecting beach nesting shorebirds, and there's all kinds of ways you can get involved. So if you just Google Florida Shorebird Alliance, this, um, this will pop up. And uh, the last thing you wanna do is a little quiz. Um, so if you see a group of birds like this on the beach, what do you do? Now we got a little some tips. We, we know this is a East Florida beach, so we've narrowed down our geography, and um, it is midwinter. So you wouldn't see semi-palmated sandpipers in midwinter, so you can take that one out of the equation. So you've, you've already narrowed down your choices. You don't have, it's not gonna be a, a snowy plover in the east, on the East Florida beach either. Um, so what do you have? Well, some of these things are sleeping, some it's kind of hard to see. Let's go down to, to this. I, I'll do them in, in reverse order then. This, you can got a couple of them with these shorter, thicker bills. This one's got a pretty big one, goes back as far as the eye at least. It looks a little bigger than the one behind it. So this is gonna be a Wilson's plover. This is gonna be a um, semi-palmated plover. So then you can think of the size. Wilson's a little bigger than semi-palmated. Let's see, this is maybe bigger than semi-palmated. You got these, this is bigger than that one. And how about this one over here? Well, this one is paler backed. So, and it's bigger than this. So let's see, this paler backed one, these all look like probably some kind of little peeps here. They're, they don't have, any band, but they're about the same size. They pretty much have to be a peep. So this is gonna be, the, the paler backed one is a sanderling then. Smaller one that is not so brown on the chest as a least sandpiper. You can't really see the leg color here. And I, I didn't really get into leg color. Um, it, it can be misleading. It, it can be good if you definitely know you're seeing the leg color correctly, but um, say a least sandpiper with yellow legs, it can get mud on the legs so they look black or the legs could just be in a shadow and they could look black or you could have a, a shorebird with black legs that are wet and the light reflects off them and they look yellow and that may seem a little like a little bit of a stretch but it believe me I've, I've been fooled by that before thinking a small shorebird had yellow legs so all right back to this one maybe dark legs doesn't have the dark chest of a leaf sandpiper oh I'll go back a minute give it away smaller than a a sander lane, and then there's another one. This is the same as number two. Well, I guess you wouldn't have these little numbers in real life here, but um, it doesn't, paler chest. This one's got a little darker chest and it's bigger. So these are Western sandpipers. 
And then we've got a three here and another three here. These are Dunlin, a little bit bigger. There you go, that proves it. Um, and here's the cool thing, sort of bringing it all together with these scientific names. The first three are colliderous. Um, I just put the genus um, first time. So Sanderling, Colidris alba, um, and then Dunlin and Western Sandpiper are both colliderous. And then these last two are caradrius. And um, if they were moving around, you'd see the foraging behavior, but even as they're, they're just uh, not, they're just sleeping or roost resting, you can see the collar, which these don't have for, for these um, caradrius clovers. So with that then, um, I'll take some questions. Hopefully I didn't go too long. Um, thank no, you. This was awesome. Right. Thank you so yeah. much, Adam. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear. Okay, mm -hmm. super, okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much. That was yeah. that was great. That was fascinating. You know, I've studied shorebirds on and off for a long time, and I still struggle. So, um, so I'm going to try really hard to uh, incorporate some of your suggestions <laughs> into my study, my study habits. Um, I did see one question in the chat. Let me find it again. It's the only one so far. But if anybody else has any other questions, just drop yeah. them in the chat, uh, and we'll get to them. Um, hang on just a second. Um, so Pete Johnson asks, what distinguishes piping plovers from snowy plovers? Okay, so that's a good question. And, and um, one of the things is the, the range, you know, it, we'll go through the whole three-step um, uh, identification, the range. They're not really on the East Coast. Now you could possibly see one out of range, but if you want to see piping plovers, and I highly recommend it because they're cute as heck, um, you want to go to the West Coast, um, either the Panhandle, there's some great uh, parks out there, far Western Panhandle, or sort of Southwest Florida are great places to go see them. Um, they, they could show up there. They have shown up on the East Coast in various places, but they're very rare. Um, as far as where they are in the beach, they're up in the sandy beaches, just like it could be a piping plover. Um, I don't have a picture of them here. Um, as far as appearance, you've got the, the Overall structure, you've got the beak, and then you've got the um, the pattern. Uh, structurally, they are they look a little bit longer legged and a little bit daintier, thinner, uh, maybe a little bigger headed uh, in proportion to their body than, than a piping plover. And um, then, as far as their beak, their beak's just a little bit thinner. And then, as far as their color, they like I said, the um, uh, piping plovers. You've got the inland one ones, which are a little darker than the coastal ones. And then you've got the variations of the light. So that's kind of tricky as far as the, the overall back color, but the, the leg color is kind of orangish, orangish colored in a piping plover, and it's kind of it's grayish colored in a um, snowy plover. So there's there's several things in there, um, but they can mess up uh, a lot of people. I saw a well-known field guide author on a field trip with 50 people on it <laughs> misidentify uh, a snowy plover in Florida because the ones where he was from look slightly different. So, you know, it, it, as, as maybe, uh, uh, hopefully I didn't make these sound too easy. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't like it when I see a presentation and someone go, oh, it's completely obvious because it, it, it often isn't. But, um, you know, it, it, if you go to somewhere, I would definitely recommend going and searching out some uh, snowy plovers. It's worth taking a trip to go see some cool uh, shorebird places on the West Coast, and then just spend some time watching them. You know what, I think too often we get in the, the um, especially happens when traveling, you get in the mindset of, I gotta get this bird, then I'll go get that bird, and when you get this, and, and, and so you, um, you go see it, and you go, oh, hey, that's a snowy plover, okay, it's got the grayish legs, and then you just go on and look at some other bird, and instead of doing that, Think about, you know, the, I mean, the, the distribution stuff, well, the range, you know, that's more think about, are they using the beach differently than some other shorebirds? What are they doing? Are they more up in the dunes? Um, are they spending more time down by the water? Think about the behaviors when they run, do they hunch down more? Do they flatten their back out? Um, do they make no sounds, you know, the, um, they, they they all, all the shorebirds make sounds. Some of them are more useful than others, more vocal, and um, uh, you know, you, you, you would identify them by sound more often. But then, you know, just try to go through all these different parts of a bird. You could start the beak 
look at, you know, what what is the shape of this peak compared to what I remember from the piping plovers I'm seeing back in the East Coast? What um, how does the collar look when it where it goes around the chest? Are, are there is there more than one? You know, if you go into breeding season, you'll see males and females and they're in breeding plumage, which is usually for these uh, rings or collared plovers, their uh, their collars are more distinct in the breeding season. So see how those vary with the um, males versus females. The males have more distinct, bigger collars in general. Um, and subtle things like, does it look like it's bigger headed than a piping plover or semi-palmeter plover? Does it, does it look longer legged? All those kinds of things. But I, I definitely recommend going taking a trip to the somewhere on the West Coast. And you can use eBird to help plan that trip. That's awesome. Um, Shannon Fun. was asking what kind of camera you use. She's loving your pictures that you Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I just have to thank the birds for the photos, not my camera. <laughs> I, I don't really know much about um, cameras or, or technology in general. It's a, it's a little um, mirrorless M50 Canon. So it's, it's actually so small that most people don't like it because you can push the wrong button by chance, but I'm used to using sort of a cruddy point and shoot. So I was used to that small format and um, it was also cheaper. Um, and then I think the more important thing, I guess, according to my friends who are photographers is the lens and it's the Canon 100 to 400 fairly new, like within the last three or four years lens. That, that's a that's a good lens. But I, I think something like, well, I mean, this is just a silhouette, but some of those pictures that you could, you could, you could have a variety of different cameras and, and get some pretty good pictures. It's the key is, you know, it, as I was saying before, how they're, they're so, um, especially in places where there are a lot of people, the, the birds get used to them. So, so they're easy to get good looks at. And if you just sit in one spot, sometimes the birds will go right up to you. So just a little bit of patience and you can get some pretty amazing pictures. I, yeah, I unfortunately don't have any good photography advice, but I saw you're having a photography talk coming up. So that will be able to give you a lot more advice on cameras. Okay, great. Um, Helen wants to know what types of these common shorebirds in Northeast Florida can be found in ponds, um, inland fields versus at the beach? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, they all could be found in a pond. Um, and especially after a storm, even something like an oyster catcher or a red knot or a ready turnstone, after a storm could show up inland. But this is another case of sort of thinking about di distribution. I didn't even mention how storms play into that. Um, and that's with distribution of birds. If it's migration and say fall migration, you have a hurricane or something, there's the shorebirds that would normally be going to the coast or, or even a big storm, they might just get put down. So it's kind of a fun time to go look for birds is right after a storm. Um, uh, that, that being said, th there are certain birds that are almost always just on the coast. Wilson's plover, uh, turnstones usually at least pretty near the coast. Uh, um, in Florida, piping plovers are on the coast, although they nest in, in, in the interior, but you just don't see them in the interior very much in migration. Um, so yeah, maybe I should think about this the other way. Um, there, there are a lot of shorebirds, so more than 40 species in Florida. Lots of them are, are inland. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of the best most concise way to explain this. Uh, spotted sandpipers, very common uh, most of the year in inland. Um, solitary sandpipers in migration inland in little ponds. And then as the ponds get bigger, the shorebird, there are more kinds of shorebirds. So for smaller ponds, um, probably the smallest ponds would be solitary sandpipers, a little bit bigger on spotted sandpiper or, or it could be a solitary still there too and then you get bigger things like a retention pond or you know a pond in the middle of a wet field or something like that and then you can have a lot more different kinds of, of shorebirds especially on migration so i know that's a long-winded not really satisfactory answer but um the, the, the best thing to another good thing to do is go look at an inland county that gets a lot of birders like uh, alachua county or Orange County and look at a shorebird, bar, look at it, look at a bar chart and look at the shorebirds and see which which ones you'll, you find inland. Um, in fact, that's a good way to study for what birds you might find um, at a sod field or somewhere inland and in, 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 even in, in Duval County is see which one, just take three or four counties, you can choose up to maybe a dozen or more in eBird that are inland from you 
and see what the distribution of shorebirds looks like and then see what months are some of these inland shorebirds showing up and then go to the sod farms in those months. The, the bigger they are, the fewer trees, the more wide open, uh, the better. And especially if they've got some little wet spots, that's, uh, that's really good for looking for these inland shorebirds. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> that is such great advice. Um, Shannon is asking if you have any additional or, or, or uh, Facebook events coming up anytime soon. She said she absolutely loved this one. So much great information. So she's curious to, to know if you have any other presentations coming up. Ah, uh, I don't remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh... Let's see, I'm doing a talk about Caracaras for Sun City Audubon in April. Um, I have, uh, there's a Sparrow talk I did that is online. I think if you go in, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not very technologically savvy here, but I think if you go into YouTube and type in my name and then Shorebird or Sparrow or maybe Birding Basics, you might be able to find some presentations. I Normally, I just love to go to all these birding festivals and Space Coast Birding Festival is a heartbreak when that was canceled. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm often, and I'll, I'll be at the Florida Birding and Nature Festival. Um, that's next fall. Um, but uh, yeah, that I, as far as I know, apart from that uh, Sun City Audubon Caracara talk, I don't think I have anything else scheduled right now. Well, that's awesome. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions um, for Adam? I don't see any additional questions in the chat. Uh, lots of people are saying how much they enjoyed it. Great information. Uh, oh, thank you all. Well, thank you. This has been very, very helpful. Like I said, I've been struggling with shorebirds for many years. And I think, especially the categorization, um, I had not ever paid very much attention to that, but that really matters. That really matters a lot. And I never realized how much it matters. So, Great. so thank you thank for you. that. And Thanks. I'm yeah, I, you know, it, it was, I, I've done this shorebird talk or, or version of this for, for a while. And, and I tried to emphasize that normally my philosophy and PowerPoint is less is better. And I don't like those, those PowerPoint slides that have half a dozen different things in there because you're looking around and you can't concentrate on anything. And um, uh, I, I even thought, well, no text is better, but I decided sort of last minute to put that text in there just to try to emphasize that, um, those relationships between the genera. And, and it, it is, I have heard people say, I don't wanna hear all that stuff, it just confuses me, but I'm, I've been trying to keep it as simple as possible. And um, so hopefully the, the Latinization. All these Latin names weren't too, too much, and 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 it, it was helpful because, as, as you said, Carol, it really does help you kind of put birds in, in uh, different little um, uh, categories, and then start working your way down from there. Uh, I actually have a an additional question from Shannon, and um, she says she's not from here, so which beach is best? And I'm not sure, are you, you're familiar enough with our area to answer that, right? If not, um, I mean, if yeah, not, I'd we can say take a stab I, at it. <laughs> I saw a pad on there. You, you probably know the beaches. I, you guys know those beaches better than me. So I'll, I'll, I'll let one, I'll, I'm actually going to have to look in the chat. Or you, I don't know if it's better to, if someone to put it in the chat or what. But um, yeah, I know there's some people up there that know those areas much better than I do. I, I, I mean, I love going to Huguenot. That that bay is just amazing there in the middle, and I, I don't know if those long spurs are still hanging around too, but that's an added bonus. Yes, they were, is uh, awesome. yeah, Huguenot is awesome. Long spur was last seen, I think, two or three days ago. So yeah, okay. it's still okay. supposed to be still around. I'm not really sure. Huguenot um, is awesome just for the for the coast and yes. for the inland bay. Okay. But I, I imagine there are probably some other places that I, I don't even know about, and then there may be some good inland places too. And I, I was actually gonna ask that because I don't know the inland spots around Jacksonville for for the places you'd wanna go on migration to look for shorebirds. Is anyone who's on that? Uh, um, yeah, anybody have, you know, you can unmute yourself and jump in if you have suggestions for those inland spots for migration for shorebirds. I am not necessarily the best person to, to answer that one. 
anybody have any contributions there, Pat? Um, Jessica, anybody? Is Pete still with us? I think. Hey, Pete, Pete here. Um, oh, hey, there he is. I haven't spent a ton of time out there, but I hear the West Side Industrial Park fields areas are pretty good on, on the inland side of Jacksonville. Sounds good. That's That makes a lot of sense. I didn't think about that one. Um, Let's see. Any other beaches that are, that that are that are really good besides um, Huguenot? I mean, I I end up just going to Huguenot almost every time unless I'm going somewhere inland. I, I don't really know the beaches that well. Well, um, I personally like it's very close to Huguenot, but it's um it's uh, uh, Herit we call it Heritage River Road wetlands. It's actually the road Heritage River Road is just runs right off of Hexer Drive, and it's um. Uh, it leads out to the Joe Carlucci Boat Ramp Park and the wetlands on the, I guess that would be the north side of the road, have recently within the last few years been restored um, by a developer, but that's a long story. Uh, and um, it's turned into a really, really good shorebird habitat, um, uh, especially during some certain times of the year, um, like there were regular wimbrels out there, quite a few wimbrels, you know, I would see eight or nine at a time. Uh, when was that? Uh, at any rate, maybe over the summer. I can't remember when I saw them. But, um, uh, and lots of other little shorebirds, you do need a scope because <laughs> they're typically a long way away. <laughs> but um, but that, that's, a, that's one of my favorite sites. Of course, it again, it is very close to Huguenot. So, and, and so like a, a few miles north of Huguenot then? It's actually a few miles, I would say west of Huguenot or south. West, of, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's a Joe Carlucci boat ramp park. That would be the turn for it. Um, it's it's a really spectacular site. I really like it. All right. Hey, uh, that site also, we've been noticing the birds are hitting some power lines a lot. Oh, that's heritage. Cool. And what are some good um, options to try to minimize impact to birds along power lines, like, so they can see the power lines? Yeah. And, you That's a great that? question. Yeah. And, and, and that, that is a, a, a big concern. And, and the, the power companies don't like that. I mean, it's bad publicity for one. Um, there are things called flight diverters, which um, can't think of where you might see them around there. If you've driven in Alachua County across Payne's Prairie, uh, you can see the power lines that are going across the prairie. They're, they're, you most commonly see them in areas with high bird traffic. I mean, they might have flight diverters at Huguenot now they think of it. I, I can't remember, but there are various types of things that they can put on the line so that birds see them. The ones on Payne's Prairie are like big spirals. There are various other things. And just having a few of those things spaced out widely enough, fairly widely apart, it will, will catch the bird's attention and, and it makes a big difference in, in bird um, uh, collisions with power lines. Cause yeah, that, that, is a, that is a pretty big issue on, on areas with high bird traffic where they're going back and forth um, and there are, there are different kind of overhead lines. So you can get in touch with the, the power company and, and, and let them know what you're seeing, just figure out who, who owns those lines. And, you know, as a probably want to sort of, um, discuss it as your Audubon chapter or something like that and kind of organize a, an approach, but, but you know, mention what you're seeing, maybe try to document uh, some birds there and show, you know, even take pictures or something like that. And, um, and then and, and get input from other people who have seen it so you can kind of build a good case for it. Because if it's just one person who said, I saw a dead bird at the power line, that's not going to be as effective as having in Audubon chapter say, do a dozen of our members have seen dead birds and here are a bunch of pictures and we went out one day and there were three different, you know, dead terns and shorebirds. And so we're gonna, you know, like to see if you can do, if you can do something and maybe even offer to help pay for it or something too. That, I mean, it's, it's, it's a worthwhile thing to do and, and it makes a big difference. And it's usually just on a fairly small stretch of line that birds are going back and forth flying by those lines. So, so it's a, it's one of those solutions that actually, or yeah, one, one of those kinds of conservation actions that, that can have a pretty big impact for a fairly simple action. Hopefully the power company will be amenable to it. Thank you. That's great. Sure. Thank you so yeah. much, Adam. That's very helpful.
it gives us a place to start. We've talked about it a little bit, but we weren't kind of, we kind of weren't sure where to, where to head. <laughs> so this is wonderful. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions or comments uh, for, um, for Adam? Just a big thank you. Yep. Amen. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much. I enjoy doing it. I uh, love going up there and watching birds and, and um, got such a great location for seeing shorebirds. Uh, hopefully the next time, instead of feeling frustrated when you go out and you see those birds a long ways away, you can just get excited about trying to divide them by their behaviors and, and um, yeah. not worry about trying to put in a, a, a species name on, on all those real distant ones and just make it a, a, a fun game because that's, that's, that's what it's all about, going out and having fun. Amen to that. Well, yeah. thanks again. Uh, good night, everybody. You. Have a wonderful evening. Uh, I am recording this presentation, so uh, the recording will be posted on our YouTube channel over the next few days, just as a reminder. All right. Thanks again, Adam. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Bye, everyone. Good night.